Hawaiina La. This is Kaui Lucas, host of Hawaii is My Mainland, every Friday at 3 p.m. Trying hard to keep it on the bright side and off the grid. Today we're trying really hard because we're going to discuss the calculated demise of Senate Bill 1109. This week, which would have prohibited the use of polystyrene foam containers by food vendors, unless the Department of Health gives an exemption or the county already has one. With me to discuss this today is Jennifer Milholland, the Waste Reduction Coordinator of Kokua Hawaii Foundation, and she's also the president of Styrophobia. And happy Girls' Day, Jennifer. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate it. So um, it's hard to be cheery today. Uh, there were so many people that were really excited about SB 1109. Um, and, and that's where that's why you're here, is because I ran into you at the, at the <laughs> Capitol, and you were there with a lot of people. Talk about this bill, what it said, and um, what we've lost. OK, um, so SB 1109 um, came about. This is not the first time that a, a foam prohibition bill has been introduced at the state level. Um, bills have been introduced since 2008, but this is actually the first time that a bill of this kind um, prohibiting uh, food vendors from distributing um, expanded polystyrene foam containers. Um, it's, this is the first time it's gotten a hearing since 2008. So just that alone is pretty monumental. Um, basically what the bill says is that any food vendors, um, which also covers caterers and hospitals, mm -hmm. but generally generally food vendors, wow. yeah. um, that y you see your characteristic um, foam clamshells, um, they're not allowed to use EPS foam, which is basically expanded polystyrene foam. It's a type of styrofoam um, is the most common name for it. Um, what it says is it's, it's, it's patterned after San Francisco's bill. Um, they, have, they have prohibited styrofoam how distribution. How long ago? How long has that bill been? Um, I'm not sure, actually. Okay. Um, but it's, it's been at least a few years, and they've had a lot of success with it. Um, but it's, it's patterned after theirs, and, and what's special about theirs is that they allow, there's an exemptions if a county decides to do its own recycling program. Um, this is a little confusing for a lot of people. They're like, why are we even allowing an exemption for, for, fo for foam recycling? The reason is that a lot of opponents of foam bans say it's too extreme, so let's talk about recycling litter management first. So this allows for exemptions if counties decide they want to pick, put together a foam recycling program. So that would be a specific recycling program just for, there would be another bin, in other words, somewhere, or how would that work? It, it would be totally up to the counties. Um, okay. So it's, it's just allowing, it's allowing counties their, their flexibility if they decided to set it up. Now granted, it's not likely that a county would decide to do that because it's very cost prohibitive to recycle foam because uh -huh. you can't recycle foam unless it's virgin. So if it's got any kind of food on it, any kind of staining, you can't recycle it. Um, uh -huh. So it's, it's one of those things that we want to allow for flexibility in the bill, but um, most likely the ban across the board would be the most effective. So as a pact practical matter, it's not recyclable. That's correct. And worldwide, okay. you're looking at less than 1% actually gets recycled. And that's usually packing peanuts because they have nothing, nothing, no food on them. <laughs> So there's nowhere to go with this material um, except to burn it, really. On Oahu, that's right. We burn it. Um, other, other counties, it goes to the landfill. Okay. But there are, speaking of the counties, let's, let's keep going on that. Sure. Um, we do have some bright news. Um, talk, tell us about that. Yes. Even though SB 1109 is technically deferred, it wasn't scheduled in time, um, there are still other foam prohibition measures going on in other counties. So. Maui, unfortunately, is a little nebulous. Um, it passed the first reading end of last year um, and has yet to be scheduled for a second reading in front of the county council hearing. Um, you know, we've talked to them about that. It's still kind of up in the air what they want to do with it. There's not a lot of clear answers as to what's going on, but effectively it's in limbo. Um, so it would need, still, still need to be scheduled or sent back to a committee. Um, but Big Island, however, has resurrected one of their foam restriction bans, uh, Bill 13, and is actually coming up for its second reading on the 8th of March. Now, I'm not sure about the other counties. Uh, would, does that have to go through three readings or would? As far as I know, yeah, yeah. Unless, unless it's sent back to a committee with revisions. <clears throat> so here, um, SB 1109, when I saw you at the Capitol, and I think we have a picture of it, there was a, an article in the uh, advertiser because there were just crowds of and lots of students. It was beautiful. It was just really heartwarming to see all these kids show up. It, it was amazing. Um, to, we had 
three separate groups of students that had that had shown up that had had wanted to be a part of it and wanted to to discuss their their part in the future and wanting not wanting to see foam out there. Um, just when I saw you, I actually didn't even get to go in and testify because it was standing room only. It was packed. People couldn't even get into the room. So I didn't even get to testify that day. Um, but what we were looking at was estimates were around 100 people showed up that day. And that is, I can't even say enough how amazing that is because 100 people showing up in the middle of the week, in the middle of a day, um, during a work week is, is amazing. Um, and that just shows how, how things are changing in terms of the level of engagement in these processes. And um, uh, those who couldn't show up in the middle of the day on a, on a work day, um, a lot of them submitted testimony too. There was there were hundreds of people who, so um, over six hundred. Yeah, over six hundred. Mm -hmm. That's that is that's incredible. So there, it it made it through the first committee, and um, it died um, in the second committee. Actually, it was never scheduled for the second committee. Uh, that's effectively okay. what happens in um, in the way our system is set up. If once it passes through a committee and it's, it's the next committee that it's, it's slated to be heard in, the chair of that committee, or joint chair in this case, they have full discretion whether or not, whether or not to even hear the bill. So what happened in this case is uh, the joint chairs, um, Senator Takuda and Baker. Um, Senator Rosalind Baker. Senator Rosalind Baker, they decided not to schedule it for a hearing. So it didn't even get a full public discourse to, to, to discuss it. Even though lots of us were submitting online testimony and calling their offices to say, "Please schedule this," so yes, it's not it's not a it's not a slam dunk. Even if you have hundreds of people, and it's basically a really good bill, although clearly <laughs> somebody thinks it it isn't. Um, so we'll get into that a little bit. But I wanted to give um, a shout out to um, the senators. Um, Will Espero and Carl Rhodes and Miley Shima Bakuro because they're the ones that introduced this bill. And um, thank you, thank you, thank you. And let's let's try again next year. Um, and maybe we'll have um, 30 schools instead of three schools. Yes. <laughs> um, with your work at um, uh, Kokua Hawaii Foundation, so they work a lot with schools. Absolutely. And um, they have a specific program, um, uh, Plastic Free Hawaii. Plastic Free Hawaii. Um, there's also three hours recycling program, and Ina in schools, and a lot of there's a lot of the components throughout all of those programs that that touch on waste reduction. Okay, so waste reduction is is kind of the hat you're wearing there, but you're also as president of Styrophobia, you know a lot about alternatives, right? I sure hope so. <laughs> <laughs> So for people who don't know what styrophobia is, why don't you give us a little? Well, styrophobia um, originally started out as a for-profit entity. It was one of the original um, companies in Hawaii that was selling um, alternatives to, to styrofoam. So compo if you guys have probably seen compostable clamshells, the, like the brown colored ones that are typically made out of um, byproduct, like wheat straw or sugar cane. Um, so basically, they were retailing compostable products. Um, but recently, in the last three years, you know, uh, we got together and we decided that it would be a lot more effective as a nonprofit, doing education, doing research, doing advocacy. Um, so we transitioned it into a nonprofit. And so the goal here is to ban styrene, polystyrene, and replace it with a compostable uh, product. Ideally compostable. Well, sorry, let me let me rephrase that. Um, typically, it's referred to as compostable or recyclable. Um, Personally, we try not to advocate for anything disposable to begin with. So re get, having reusable only is, is the ultimate goal, but we know that that's not entirely practical, practical right off the bat. So that's why we advocate for compostable products because right from the beginning upstream, compostable products are non-toxic and they don't, you know, they don't cause damage, to, they don't cause harm to the workers that are, that are creating them. And if they, get, if they do get in the environment as litter, they're not going to attract other toxins and So this things. would be a good time to um, reiterate uh, the difference between biodegradable and compostable. Sure, thank you for bringing that up. <laughs> um, that is a really, really common source of confusion. Um, I think everyone has probably seen the plastic bags that say biodegradable, they have pictures of a tree, you know, it's a, it's a very sunny, bright image, like eco-friendly, you can do it, biodegradable. Um, but what's, what's happening is with that definition is that there's 
the first thing you have to know is that there's the colloquial usage, the common, like, if you ask an average person on the street, what do they think it means? Then there's the industrial definition, the legal definition of what something can be called biodegradable as. Um, if you ask the average person on the street what biodegradable means, they think, um, if I toss it on the side of the road, after seven days it'll disappear into nothing toxic, won't even see it. Um, but if you look at the actual legal like, business definition of biodegradable, it says, must break down and become indistinguishable in soil. There's no time frame. There's no requirements for whether or not it can be toxic free. Um, there's basically no parameters on, on what has to happen. It just has to disappear. Um, so what effectively happens in those biodegradable products, um, they're not breaking the law because by industry definition, they are biodegradable. What's happening is up, anywhere up to 97% plastic is being mixed in with corn resin. So what happens is it gets out there into the world and bacteria start to eat the corn. So instead of one plastic bag in the ocean, you have thousands. Uh, it's so impossible to clean up. How it Ah, uh, that's yeah. how we get those microplastics. Right, that's, that's a big part of it. Interesting. Is it, 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 it degrades. It photodegrades. It doesn't biodegrade. Um, so it's, it's actually really fasc fascinating. So actually avoid those, bio, those bags labeled biodegradable okay. or the products labeled biodegradable because they're worse for the environment than just a regular plastic bag. Okay, thanks for, sure. for clearing that up. <laughs> yeah. Okay, and then just as a, what would time frame be for a compostable uh, container. If you um, so actually, the companies that manufacture the compostable products, um, especially if it's a compostable plastic, mm -hmm. um, they actually don't recommend that you just put it in your backyard composting because for it to break down, it requires a certain temperature and it requires a certain amount of aeration. So it typically, doesn't happen in a backyard composter. But if you go to an industrial, like a large scale composting facility, usually an in vessel system, it's contained, has air forced into it, it's turned a lot. Um, you're looking at, I believe, 90 days. Okay. Know, so. And I had on my show a guy from um, uh, Lebanon who oh, yeah. invented a process that can shorten that 90 days to 10. So wouldn't it be cool if we had one of those here? That would be amazing. <laughs> so how long, if it's left to its own, to present state, if I go to l and and get my beloved um, ginger chicken and it comes in that hateful <laughs> styrofoam box. Um, how long is that styrofoam box going to last, going to exist? So uh, in, its, in, its, in its primary form, the whole box, it it's probably will break down within a week. It'll disappear in a week. What's going to happen is it, it breaks down into these tiny little pieces, but the plastics themselves never disappear. In fact, I don't know if you've heard this, within the last week or so, they, they found plastics, residue plastics, at the bottom of the Marianas Trench, seven miles deep. So plastic is persisting, and it's not going away. Thank you for bringing me. I was driving into to work the morning when that happened, and I, yeah, it, it's deeply uh, affecting. And on that note, we're going to take a one-minute bait to, to, to recover ourselves <laughs> and talk some more about this. Okay. Aloha, my name is John Waihe, and I actually had a small part to do with what's happening today. Served actually in public office. But if you don't already know that, here's a chance to learn more about what's happening in our state by joining me for Talk Story with John Waihe every other Monday. Thank you, and I look forward to your seeing us in the future. I've got the Beagle Sisters here with a healthy tip. We encourage you to enjoy the food you eat this holiday season and keep it local and healthy. Yeah. Eat the rainbow. Eat yeah. the rainbow. And if you need any produce, come to the Red Barn on the North Shore. Welcome back to Hawaii is my mainland. I'm Kawi Lucas, and with me today is Jennifer Milholland, who is with Kokua Hawaii Foundation and Styrophobia. And we are um, mourning the demise of Senate Bill 1109 this week, which would have um, made it um, uh, really hard for, but not impossible, to um, sell food in styrofoam containers. Okay, so um, <laughs> Jennifer, you were just talking about that story that came out last week, seven miles down in the Marianas Trench, 
What was that? What was that substance that they found d down there? BPA, bis bisphenol A. It's a pla it's, used, it's commonly used in plastics. Okay, in the United States, we haven't been able to use it for since the '80s. So um, that stuff has been around for a really long time. And yeah. it's known to be a hormone disruptor, so it's nasty stuff. <laughs> nasty stuff. Okay, and w here in Hawaii, with so much coastline and um, so much water around us that seems to attract plastic like a magnet, it's just quite amazing. Um, you gave us a, a video, let's, let's look at that, that shows some of the effects that um, that plastic has in our immediate environment here. I'm going to try just to catch some of this. It looks like confetti. I'm going to use this sieve and just catch what I could here, like that. Look at this. It's all pieces of microplastic. It's washed up shore here. The, the ocean works like a blender. And it's blending the plastic down to these smaller pieces, these fragments. Uh, fragments that are available in, in the food chain in the future. I never saw anything like it. Already in 10 years, the amount of plastic in the oceans, it will double. And in 2050, there will be four times this amount in the water. I think that's pretty frightening. Okay, so what are some of the alternatives and um, why aren't we using them? Well, um, if, you can, if you can look at it wearing the other hat a little bit. Well, um, like we've already mentioned, there are compostable alternatives. Um, so it's, it's all products that are in the same form, the same mold. Every distributor on the island carries some form of well, I should just say virtually every, every distributor on the island carries some form of compostable product. They also carry um, products in the same molds that are in styrofoam, but they're recyclable plastics. And when I say recyclable, I mean recyclable in Hawaii, so ones and twos. Um, so there's definitely, there is a wide range of products available um, to vendors. Um, I would say the reason we're not using them, there's, there's multiple reasons. Um, the most common is that uh, business claim that they're too expensive. Um, so what happens with that is tip, I mean, you typically will see that products that are not foam, foam is very, very cheap and very ubiquitous. So you will see that typically alternative products will cost a little bit more, but there are more multiple cases where they cost less or they cost the same. So we cannot say absolutely that they're always going to cost more. Um, so cost concern is one reason. Um, and you know vendors talk to each other. They're just like, oh, no, it's too expensive. So hearsay is part of it. Um, Do you have any sense of um who or um, how many uh, restaurants or food establishments are now using compostable products? Do you have a sense of the market share in any way? Um, absolutely. And we know in Hawaii uh, there are over 130 restaurants that are voluntarily foam free. So that, that means they're. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So they're choosing not to use foam um, without a mandate in place, without a ban in place. Does this include like takeout restaurants? Absolutely. Wow, that's yeah. great. There, there's a wide number of restaurants that have chosen, or food vendors that, that choose not to use foam, whether or not for environmental reasons or because they found it cheaper or because, because they found it the same price or demand from their customers. So we know then that it is possible to use compostable products and not go under. It is absolutely possible, and that's what we see a lot. Um, in fact, the objections to a lot of these bills that come up are our, the main objectors are, you know, the, the trade associations, the Hawaii restaurants associations, chemistry councils. What they continue to claim is that it's a lot of speculation. Basically, a lot of the bills die from speculation. Basically, saying speculation about basically what happens is you see a lot in hearings, um, industry or um, lobbyists will come in and say, if you do this, businesses will fail. If you do this, businesses will go under. Um, they won't be able to make any money. So there's a lot of there's a lot of fear basically created about. If you do this, you'll be anti-business. You will put businesses down. Um, and we know, we know that that is just untrue in this case. We know it from local examples, and we know it from, from national examples, we know it from global examples. Um, for example, in San Jose, um, so California has 
multiple counties that are foam free. Um, wow. So what happened was San Jose, following their own foam prohibition, from their own Chamber of Commerce said, you know, they got they they're like, this is going to hurt businesses. It's going to hurt businesses. It's going to put them under. So following their their passage of their foam free bill, what they did was they did an investigation. They looked at 28 counties that were over 80,000 in population. And they investigated, and they found not one single instance of negative um, economic impact to businesses. Okay, 28 different counties in the San Jose area. Oh, uh, in California. In California, spread all over the place, mm -hmm. that have chosen not to um, they have, have phone. They have phone-free phone. bans, yeah. So no, none of the vendors in those counties can. And so what they're... They were, they were like, we want to know, like, is this actually impacting businesses or businesses going under? And they found not one single instance. And locally, we're seeing that it's not the case because, as you mentioned, um, that we know of over 130 restaurants in the minimum. That's just the ones we found since we started looking that are foam free voluntarily. And not only are they not going under, but they're thriving. So just the, the implication, the speculation that, that businesses will go under is, is false. Well, I, I was surprised when I went to uh, Nico's at the pier. Um, uh, Pier 38 there, and they wanted 25 cents for a compostable container. And I thought, well, okay, I'm going to walk the talk here. I'm going to pay 25 cents to just to make the point that, you know, I mean, what is that? That's 15 minutes uh, in, a, in a parking meter. Yeah. Um, but I was kind of shocked. It's like, I, can it really be that much more for a compostable container? It does not typically cost the vendor 25 cents, no. What vendors will choose to do is they will, if they decide to pass on the cost to the consumers, they will make a nice round even number. They don't, they don't want to charge like the eight cents or the 10 cents extra because it just doesn't look as good. So they, so when, when vendors are actually charging you 25 cents, it is more than likely that they're making money off of that. Okay, well. <laughs> but if, if I could use that opportunity to make a point, um, so the average person, you know, goes out to eat 100 times a year. So if you, if you decide that as a, as a person that wants to support um, compostable alternatives, you want to pay that 25 cents per time, you're looking at, at twice a week, um, every week. So what you end up paying over the course of a year is $25. And so you can ask yourself, or they can ask you, <laughs> basically, over the course of the year, is $25 worth you know, protecting our environment? And oh most people would say yes. <laughs> protecting our environment, and uh, really the... the, the our environment and and the the, the animals that it, it's it's you, you sent me some pictures and well um, I'm gonna look away so <laughs> but but we have to we have to see that we have to take that in we have to know that that when we choose styrofoam we are choosing to harm living beings that are defenseless and don't have a choice effectively yes Right. Um, wh wh what you know, they can't help it. Right. They're they're just it's it's swimming in their it's their air. Right. right. It's they it, oftentimes it gets confused for food for food. It's when animals ingest these, they don't they don't realize they're eating plastic. They're not choosing to eat plastic. They think that it's in this case of the turtles, like they tend to think the plastic bags are jellyfish. Um, fish think that they're just eating a piece of coral, maybe, and it 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 amplifies in the environment. So one piece of plastic, you know, it's it's piece of oil. Um, it's one little piece of toxin, but a lot of toxins are hydrophobic, so they want to get away from water, so they'll cling to the nearest piece of plastic. So it's an amplification. Uh, so by the yeah. time it gets back into our fish that we're eating, it's you know, 15, 20 times more toxic than it was when it first went into the ocean. And, and this picture here just breaks my heart. A hundred plastic bags in mm -hmm. that one wheel. Right. And this is, I think these pictures are very hard to, to see, obviously, but they definitely kind of exemplify the choice that we're making, because it really is a choice. We're deciding that our convenience culture is more important than the impacts they're having on these animals and our environment. And I, I, I really don't think that it's just the mom and pop shops. I mean, you've, you've mentioned their, their large chains in, involved. And so um, making people responsible, I mean, I think if people really saw the direct connection between um, do I want to cause tumors in, a, the beloved Honu, mm -hmm. because I chose to stop at 7-Eleven and get a cup of coffee. Uh. Yeah, and a lot of what you see, a lot of the objections are like, we don't need to focus on bans, we need to focus on litter, we need to focus on recycling. And the problem with that is that it, it puts, the, it puts the, the, um, the onus, the responsibility off of those that are choosing to distribute it and puts it on human behavior. And anyone that's ever tried to change human behavior 
knows that it is damn near impossible and it will take years. You know, so basically what's happening is we have a, a situation that's so urgent in terms of the impact, impacts of plastic pollution that we need to do something that's more proactive. You know, we need to remove this substance. We need to take it out of circulation. And we focus on foam specifically out of all the other plastics because it's because of the impact it has. It's one of the most known toxin, toxics, highest, mo most toxic that we know of, and it just breaks apart. And I, you know, I was really happy to see that um, doing a little research on the show that uh, uh, the, the mecca of our consumer culture here, uh, Costco, mm -hmm. even has compostable um, clamshells now. They do. It's from uh, World Centric. Um, they're an awesome company. They, they create, they manufacture the compostable products. Um, and you, if you actually compare, so they sell, they sell the styrofoam trays right next to the, um, the world centric compostable clam clamshells. And the difference between them is $4 for a case of 100. So that comes down to, to four cents extra. And that's, that's cheaper than the distributors can get it. So if you're, if you're a vendor in Maui, go. Okay, can you repeat that again <laughs> slowly, please? Sorry about that. I get excited. Yeah. Um, so the difference in cost is, is for a case of 100 is $4. A case of a hundred compostable at Costco mm -hmm. clamshells. Mm -hmm. Not those are not those. That's for nine-inch clamshells. Nine-inch clamshells, which most um, takeout places use. Correct. Is four dollars more than the styrofoam. Correct, and it breaks down to about four cents extra per. You know, I, it's indefensible. Just really indefensible. Yeah, because if you break it down, if you say a restaurant serves 100 covers, that basically just means 100 meals. You know, you're looking at four dollars extra a day. You know, and, and the the idea that that could break someone, I think, is indefensible. You you can't you can't make that argument. I I, I love that study in uh, California. Hopefully, when the bill comes around again <laughs> next year. Uh, that kind of argument, I mean, I assume that, that you guys submitted testimony on that. We did, absolutely. And all of the objections to the phone bill can be, can be combated. They are um, con confronted, I guess. But without the chance to have the discourse on it, public discourse on the record, we can't, we can't make those. All the deals get made behind doors. Thank you, Jennifer. <laughs> okay, so we, know, we have our mandate for next year. We're going to save our marine life yes. and our and our beaches and our water and um, make sure that we are not using styrofoam anymore. <laughs>